So we're going to start with question 14 here. And this one is create a rational function with x-intercepts 2, 0 and negative 2, 0. So let's start with the basic rational function. So the form rational means polynomial divided by polynomial. The numerator is the zeros. Denominator are the uh, vertical asymptotes. There's also a numerical coefficient in front. Sometimes it's one, and then you can leave it out, but a lot of times it's not one. So this is what we're looking for here. Let's start with the zeros. And we got the first one, x equals two. And that corresponds to x minus two as a factor. And it says bounce. That means it's even power. So we're gonna go with the smallest even power, which is two. Our next zero, x equals negative two, we're right there. And that negative two corresponds to a similar factor, but this one will be x plus two. And order one is a cross. So I'm just gonna put a one up there. Uh, another easy way to remember these, that negative two value is the x value that should turn this entire factor into zero. So negative two plus two is zero, another way to remember it. All right, so we're ready to take these zeros to our function. So we got x minus two squared times x plus two. All right, so our denominator are the vertical asymptotes. So we got x equals negative one, and that's order one. So it's gonna be two of the first power. So it'll be x plus one to the first. Now this goes in the denominator. Now just to warn you, these powers could be a higher power. So instead of a two, this could have been a four or a six or an eight or a 10 or any even power. Likewise, this one could have been a three, five, seven, nine, et cetera. This other one down here could have been three, five, seven, nine, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just picking the lowest powers that uh, give me crossing or bouncing. All right, we're almost there. I'm gonna bubble in the ones we've taken care of. So there's two that we have not. Uh, end behavior down on both sides. So the way I write end behavior, f of x is going to negative infinity as x goes to plus and minus infinity. All right, so let's not use that quite yet. I'm about to use the y-intercept. So the y-intercept, the x value is always going to be 0 for a y-intercept, and our y value is negative 16. So what I'm going to do is now take 0 and f it, meaning I'm going to plug it into our f of x function right here. So f of zero equals a times zero minus two. That's squared, zero plus two is just two, and then just zero plus one is one. Now this is supposed to be negative 16. We're just gonna reduce this. Negative two squared is two times two, which is four, times another two is eight, and it's eight divided by one. So solve for a, we just multiply by one eighth. And that's a, so we got negative two is a. <clears throat> All right, so we're just gonna take that and rewrite our f of x, except we're just gonna drop in a negative two for a. All right, so there's our f of x. There's one last piece of information I did not look at yet, just took care of that y-intercept. Let's look at the end behavior down on both sides. So I'm gonna throw away, I'm gonna highlight all these for a second, things I'm gonna get rid of. I'm getting rid of the two, that two, and the plus one. And I'm gonna keep what's left. Remember, we're not doing algebra here, so I'm not it would be incorrect to say f of x equals because it's not the same function as the one up here. So I'm giving it a new name, which is y. 
So I just have an x squared, an x in my numerator. My denominator is just a single x. Now I can cancel these two x's. So we got y equals negative two. The x's cancel and it's negative two x squared. So we got even power and negative. The way I remember this even means they both match. They're either both up or they're both down. And we know they're both down because of negative. So there's our end behavior. It matches the end behavior specified up here. So everything checks out. Uh, there's one thing in the instructions you may have missed, the and graph it. All right, so we're gonna go do that right now. I do not have graph paper on here. That's okay. We're not gonna make a super precise graph. I'm already starting out with a really bad straight line. So I'm going over to two, negative two. Those are my x-intercepts. My vertical asymptote is somewhere, negative one. I'm gonna swap to, we'll go purple. Trying to separate this out. This is not going to be the prettiest graph right here. <laughs> and we're ready to apply the end behavior now. So it's down on both sides. So from the furthest thing on the left is this negative two here. So I'm going to start at negative two and go down on the left. This should go more and more steeply downwards. So something like that. The right end behavior is similar, it goes to the right and down. The furthest thing to the right is this x-intercept. Uh, now I need to be careful. We do have, to have a vertical asymptote right here, negative one, but that vertical asymptote was not the furthest thing to the left or the right. The furthest thing to the left was an intercept, x-intercept. The furthest thing to the right was an x-intercept. All right, now we're ready for our middle behavior here. Crossing and bouncing are crucial. So we're gonna go to the original the positive two x-intercept is a bounce. So let's do that. Positive two x-intercepts a bounce. So it should hit the x-axis and then uh, leave going uh, on the bottom. Not if it cr crossed, we'd be going up here, but this is just bouncing. All right, the next thing we have to do, we do have a y-intercept of negative 16. Clearly, if I make this to scale, negative 16 won't be on the page. So that'll just be negative 16 right there. And just looking, I'm kind of curving too steep to really hit 16. So I'll just redraw this curve like that. You never bounce on a y-intercept. Here's the reason. If you bounce, you no longer have a function because you fail your vertical line test. So our y-intercepts here, we cross. We now need to approach the vertical asymptote. There's only one choice. We cannot approach at the top because we would need a new x-intercept, which we don't have. So there's only one way to approach the vertical asymptote, which is downwards. All right, we're almost there. This vertical asymptote is a cross, which means if you approach bottom on one side, you approach top on the other. So we approach on the, coming from the left, we're approaching the top. Luckily, this negative two is a cross as well. So there's our uh, intercept we're doing right now. All right, so we just got to cross and go up. Don't need the keyboard. All right, so there's our graph. You can go to Desmos and graph this if you'd like. All right, that's question number one. Well, I mean question number 14. All right, question 15. Let me get started on that one now. So we got two basic domain questions here. Uh, now I do have the printed page next to me. I kind of copy and pasted the text here. So some of them are a little bit hard to read. It's the G of X that I'm worried about. So I'm looking at the original. All right, <clears throat> the original G of X, the square root went all the way across. That is important. That will have a significant impact on the domain. So make sure that you write your question down correctly. So we'll start f of x equals one over two minus x. All we need to do is look and see when is the denominator equal to zero. So we're looking for bad x's. And so we're intentionally dividing by zero, and then we're gonna eliminate this x value. 
So I'm gonna add x to both sides, x equals two. This is a bad x value, so we're taking two out, and we're left with two intervals right here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and write the intervals here over, over here for, well, I'll just write them down here in circle. Dang infinity to two, union to positive infinity. All right, this is part A, make sure you, you label that. I just can't really fit that nicely up here with the size of the pen I'm using. All right, so that's F. Now we're gonna go look at G. Now for G of X, we're using a slightly different rule. It's the square root rule. So before we made sure we did not divide by zero. So that's the first rule. Now we're looking at square root X plus three. All right, for this rule, we have to make sure our square roots or even roots are positive. So, or another way to say it, even roots cannot be negative. So here we're gonna do something similar where I'm looking at x plus three, and we're gonna start by saying that this must be zero or more. So here's again some easy algebra, subtract three, and we got negative three less than or equal to x. It already has little on the left, big on the right, here we got negative three. I'm filling in the dot because you're allowed to be equal to negative three. And x can be bigger than that. So I'm using a square bracket and we're going all the way to infinity. So that'll be negative three comma infinity. And this is the answer for part B. So now we got our two basic domains. Now what we're gonna do is look at uh, two compositions. We'll do f of g first. So this is part C, f of g of x. So what I'm gonna do, I always work inside out on these, so I'm gonna replace g of x with square root x plus three. Now what does f do? This is a little bit tricky. I wrote f of x here. What I'm gonna do now is write f of a box. It's one over two minus a box. Now all we're gonna do is take that square root x plus three and write it inside the box. Clearly that box is too small. So we'll just write it a little bit bigger. One over two minus, I'm gonna erase this box in a second. All right, you could write it like this, but usually we don't use the box as a grouping symbol in math. We use parentheses. In this case, the square root already groups us in, uh, for our order of operations, so you really don't need the extra, the square root already groups x plus three, so you don't really need that parenthesis, but we can put it there anyways. All right, so this is a f of g of x. I wanna find the domain. So again, both rules are in play here. We have a fraction. So we have a denominator. We also, when I say denominator, that means the entire denominator. We also have a square root. Good news, we already figured out the restriction for our square root. Now I just have to make sure I'm not dividing by zero. <clears throat> so I'm gonna set zero equal to two minus square root, x plus three. We'll add our square root to the other side. x plus three equals two. All right, so why did I do this? Well. A lot of times you wanna solve for zero, but in this case, we already had solve for zero, and I wanna get rid of a square root, and the way you do that is by squaring. The problem is if I square in this form, if I square both sides, I can square zero, that's not a problem, but if I square the right side, I have to foil this out, and my outside inside terms are still gonna have the square root. So it's gonna be a total mess if I just square it in this form. So I'm gonna add the square root to the other side. Now when I square both sides, the square root just disappears, it cancels with the square. And on the right side, I have two squared, which is four. X plus three equals four, so X equals one. Now remember, this was a bad X value. So I have to go and pull one out of our interval right here. So I need to remove one 
from the interval negative 3 comma infinity. So if you're a visual person, you may have already done this in your head. So we got negative 3. I got to remove positive 1. So now we have an interval from negative 3 to 1 and 1 to infinity. We do have to make sure we include negative 3. So we got negative 3 comma 1 union 1 to infinity. All right, so that is our domain for part C. Now we're going to go domain for part D. So part D, we're going to compose them in the other order. So this is g of f of x. So here f is going first, so it's 1 over 2 minus x. And then what does a g function do? The g function takes that input and goes square root of that whole thing plus 3. So if I use that box notation, this is what's in the box right there, the input, which normally was just an x. Now it's this whole 1 over 2 minus x. Then you add 3 and square root it. So that's g. All right, so what's going on here? We have a square root. We also have a chance to divide by 0. So we look at divide by 0. We have 1 bad x, and it's just the same x equals 2. We already did that calculation should be pretty obvious that when you plug in 2, you get 2 minus 2, which is 0. All right, so that's one thing we had to look for was this denominator right there. Now what we're going to do is consider the whole thing in the square root. So uh, we don't want to have a negative even root. So I'm going to do the same thing we did last time, where 0 is going to be less than or equal to what's in the box. All right, so this looks very easy, but we need to be careful <clears throat> because uh, we are dealing with a rational fu function inequality here. So I'm going to go ahead and add 3 using common denominator. So I'm going to create a new function. Let h of x equal... 1 over 2 minus x plus 3, and we use common denominator. So it's 3 times 2 minus x over 2 minus x. And this is 1 plus, we get 6 minus 3x. Divided by 2 minus x, which is 7 minus 3x over 2 minus x. And again, we want to know when is uh, And is h of x greater than or equal to 0. All right, we just have to graph this function. Unfortunately, I don't like the form this function is. I like my x terms to be positive. Luckily, they're both negative, so there's an easy fix for this. What I'm going to do is multiply by negative 1 over negative 1. The reason is it's going to flip all the signs in numerator and denominator. The reason I'm allowed to do this is because negative 1 over negative 1 is just 1. So I'm multiplying by 1, which won't change anything. We get negative 7 plus 3x and negative 2 plus x. And now I'm going to write it in the reverse order, 3x plus negative 7, or 3x minus 7, divided by x minus 2. All right, I realize I'm running over the next problem. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to move that down. Actually, I should move it down now so I can write in that. Oh, boy. Looks like I broke it. Nope. All right, we're okay. So our end behavior, y equals 3x over x. x is cancel. y equals 3. So it's a horizontal line. y equals 3. All right, there's one x-intercept, and it's a cross. Now it's a little tricky to see. We got 0 equals 3x minus 7. So add 7, divide by 3, and that's x. And this is going to be across x-intercept. All right, vertical asymptote. x equals 2, and that's another cross. All right, that should be enough 
to graph this. 7 thirds, unfortunately, is very close to 2. It's bigger than 2. 2 would be 6 thirds. So here's our vertical asymptote, 7 thirds. What am I doing? No, oh, it's my x-intercept. Wow. X-intercept is 7 thirds, so we'll just say that's 7 thirds. And this x equals 2, which is 6 thirds, uh, is our vertical asymptote. All right, end behavior, y equals 3. That'll be horizontal line, y equals 3. Uh, you can get the y-intercept pretty easily. Just plug in, let's see, you plug in 0. We have negative 7 over negative 2, which is 3.5, positive 3.5, so right about there. All right, end behavior and intercept, vertical asymptote, we are ready to graph. So let's zoom in a little bit here. Let's switch, let's go green. All right, so from 7 thirds to the end behavior, you have to approach like this. All right, everything is a cross here, so we're gonna cross over. Our vertical asymptote, we're also gonna cross over from the top. We have to hit our y-intercept and then approach this horizontal line. So here is the graph of our function. You can check this on Desmos or any graphing utility. The question we're trying to answer is when is this function greater than zero? Somewhere around here. Oh, we already had that on the screen. When is h of x greater than or equal to zero? So I'm gonna shade in. In fact, this function is greater than zero almost everywhere. So I'll be shading a lot of this and I'm gonna go and use a highlighter here. You can equal zero. So I include the x-intercept and all this and all of this. So that's quite a bit. In fact, the only piece we're missing is just the small interval from two to seven thirds. All right, there's one more number we have to remove. Two is also bad right here. Good news is two is already missing. So I don't need to do anything additional here. So I don't have to remove two in any other way. All right, I do need to answer this in interval notation. So the answer to part D is gonna be negative infinity. I'm just writing down the X values that I highlighted. Negative infinity to two, do not include two, starting at seven thirds. Now seven thirds is okay, so square back at seven thirds comma positive infinity. So that's the answer to part D right there. All right, question 16. Uh, on this, <clears throat> I already told you the function is one to one, but I'm going to test the one to oneness of this function. So we're gonna suppose that f of a equals f of b. So what is f of a? Let me rewrite f of x here. I don't like to write fractions on one line. I know you have to type it like that on a computer, but not the greatest for doing math. Oh boy. Negative divided by x. All right, so we're gonna suppose f a equals f of b. That means negative three a plus one over a equals negative three b plus one over b. So I just took a and b, and dropped it in for x. All right, first thing we'll multiply by negative one. And in fact, we can do a little better than that. I see if I multiply by a and b, I will eliminate fractions. That's, I don't really like fractions. So anytime I can leave fraction land is a good time for me. So I'm gonna multiply by negative to cancel the negative signs and a times b, because what that's gonna do, I'll show all the steps here. So the negatives should be pretty clear how they cancel. So I'm multiply by AB equals three B plus one over B. And again, I just canceled the negatives out already. All right, so why did I do this? Because A's cancel here and B's cancel here. You still have three A plus one times B equals three B plus one 
times A. Uh, now this is called a symmetric equation in terms of A and B because A and B play the exact same role, but that's not part of this course whatsoever. Uh, but we're going to find out that that means that A and B are interchangeable. Uh, so how in the world do we, we're trying to show that A equals B, and there's a few algebra steps in between that are not easy. So one way to think about this is solve for A. So if I try to solve for A, uh, it might be tempting to do some divided by A, uh, but then you have fractions, you're kind of back to where you started. So what I'm gonna do instead is distribute into these products, 3AB plus B equals 3AB plus A. All right, what to do here? 3AB, 3AB, so if we subtract 3AB, not multiply, but subtract 3AB on both sides, they'll cancel, and what are we left with? B equals A, and that's what we're supposed to show right there. So we showed that A equals B, meaning if we start with Y values that are the same, then we automatically get that the X values had to be the same. That's what it means to be one-to-one. -one. All right, so we just passed the one-to-one -one test. Now let's follow the instructions. Find its inverse, and then at the end we're gonna check by showing that F of F inverse cancels. All right, there's two steps to finding inverses. You gotta swap X and Y. First problem is we don't have a Y. So we'll start by writing down just F of X which was 3x plus 1 over x. All right, we don't have a y, but y is always f of x. So I'm going to swap out f of x and put in y. So now for step one, we're going to swap x and y. So we got x equals negative 3y plus 1 over y. All right, so we swap x and y. Step two, solve. Now, if you're not sure which letter you should be solving for, just look. If we're solving for x, there's no work to do, so that would be pointless. So we'll be solving for y. All right, y is in two places. That's always more fun. Uh, what to do first here? I think getting out of fraction land is a good move. So I'm going to multiply by y. That's going to be my first move. So we got xy equals negative 3 y plus 1. Now if you write it like this, you have written the wrong thing. If, if you just write uh, this pretty much just by canceling out the y, the negative up here means the whole fraction is negative. So there's an implied order of operations. So down here I have to make sure that this whole 3y plus 1 is negative. So I'll distribute the negative sign, 3y minus 1, all right, we're trying to solve for y, so I want to get y by itself with no friends. Okay, so I want y on one side, so I'm gonna move this negative three y over, I'm gonna add three y, x y plus three y equals negative one, almost there. Y appears twice, and they're both first powers, so I'm gonna factor y out and then divide so we got negative 1 over x plus 3 and this is f inverse all right so we are done with getting the inverse now what we're going to do is check this and the way we're going to do that is just like it says up at the top we're going to go f and then f inverse and hopefully they cancel out to just x <clears throat> it does not matter the order. Both orders should should turn into reduced down to x, meaning if you go f of f inverse of x, you should get x. And also if you go f inverse of f of x, you should get x. I'm just going to follow along with what the instruction said, which is f of f inverse. So we'll go this order. I always go outside in. So f of, now I'm writing f inverse here. This negative sign could be written up here or could be written down here. Can't be both. I'm just gonna keep it up in the numerator. All right, so now we're gonna f this. Now, 
f of x is now at the upper left corner here. So I want you to look over here. I'm going to write f, f of a box equals negative three of those boxes plus one over another box. So it's going to show up twice. So we'll start with negative three times negative one over x plus three plus one divided by negative one over x plus three. All right, so how in the world are we supposed to reduce this down to x? Well, we've got some work to do. All right, first big problem, we got fractions of fractions here. So that's not very fun. Uh, there's a few ways to do it. I could multiply by the reciprocal. That would be a very reasonable thing to do. Multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. I would recommend that move. Uh, another nice one, and we'll work in this situation because I have the same denominator here. What I can do is multiply by one, but the version of one will be this x plus three over x plus three. The numerator x plus three is distributed to both terms in the numerator. The denominator x plus three is distributed to the one term in the denominator. I didn't mean to point at the denominator of the denominator, but distributes uh, into this. All right, so why are we doing this? Because it's gonna cancel our denominators. So we got negative three times negative one over x plus three times x plus three plus one times x plus three divided by negative one over x plus three times x plus three. So we're definitely gonna get some cancellations. That was the entire motivation for doing this. All right, x plus three, x plus three, uh, x plus three and the other x plus three because they're being uh, divided and multiplied. That's why they cancel. All right, what are we left with? We're left with three times negative one plus x plus three divided by, and the denominator you just have a negative one. All right, so this negative one cancels that negative out. And we got negative three plus x minus, uh, plus three, minus three plus three cancel, we got x. All right, so we do indeed have the inverse. All right, now we're going to work on number 17 here. All right, so we gotta solve these equations. All right, first one, I'm gonna rewrite over here, log three of one ninth equals A. Technically, this is already solved for A, but uh, I want to reduce this all the way. So we're actually gonna unsolve it for A. And the way we're gonna do that, we're gonna move the base to the other side into exponential form. So we got 1 ninth equals three, base three to the A power. So how in the world can we rewrite 1 ninth as a base three? Well, nine is three squared. And the reciprocal means negative power. So now you can match exponents because the base match a equals negative two. All right, that's the end of part A. Uh, now you can do this part A a different way. Let me change colors for that way. If you know your properties of logs and exponentials, so I'll write down the property here. So log base A of the exponential A function to the m power equals m. Because the log function and the exponential function are inverses, they cancel out just like what happened before when f of f inverse cancels to x. That's exactly what's happening right here. And you can use that property. One ninth we just saw is three to the negative two power. So I'm just rewriting one ninth as three to the negative two. And now I'm gonna use that property above, which says that all of this completely cancels and you're left with negative two equals a. So either way you wanna do it, totally fine. All right, part B. So there is a property I can exploit here, but uh, that's very similar to what we just looked at. But I really like using the definition, and that's the way I'm gonna solve this. So first thing I'm gonna do is move the base over with the definition. So 
So we got log two of one equals b. So I'm going to move the base over. So one equals two to the b. And now you need to figure out, can I write one as a base uh, two? So two to what power equals one? Hopefully you remember your power rules, two to the zero power equals one. And now we can say that b equals zero. And that's our answer. All right, next up, <clears throat> I had some trouble uh, on this program. They don't let you superscript a superscript, meaning uh, and exponents are typeset using a superscript. So what I'm going to do is rewrite this with some parentheses. So this is closer to how it looks on the paper. And first problem we have is the bases don't match, but maybe we can get everything into a base five. So let's write five to the first power is five, five squared is 25, five cubed is 25 times five, which is, whenever I do powers of five, uh, I like to think in terms of change here. So I have, I think of this as five, five quarters. How much is that? It's a dollar twenty-five or one hundred and twenty-five cents. Uh, so we got one hundred and twenty-five is five cubed. Five to the x squared plus eight equals five cubed to the two x power, and five cubed to the two x is. You have a power of a power, so you're going to multiply. So this is five to the three times two x. Five to the x squared plus eight. All right, we got bases matching, which means powers uh, must match. So that means x squared plus eight equals six x. I just multiplied three times two x. x squared subtracts six x plus eight equals zero. So you've got three choices. You have a quadratic equation. We can go complete the square, quadratic formula, or factor get lucky. I think factor get lucky is gonna work here, uh, but the problem is everybody goes factor and get lucky. And I'm gonna go complete the square. So the complete the square formula, we have x squared plus bx equals x plus b over two squared minus b over two squared. So here our b is negative six, so our b over two is negative three. So this is x plus negative three, or x minus three squared minus minus three squared. And I just did that for the x squared minus six x. There's bring down the plus eight, you still have equal zero. All right, negative three squared is nine but then you're subtracting it. So it's negative nine plus eight. All right, your math brain might be trained to foil this out, but if you do, you're gonna find out that you're right back here. Congratulations, you went backwards. But the reason we're doing this is so x appears one time now instead of twice. So minus nine plus eight is minus one. We add the negative one to the other side. So we got x minus three squared. We're gonna square root both sides. All right, square root of one is one, but we started with a square being square rooted, so we get that plus minus. So we got three plus or minus one. So there's two answers, three plus one or three minus one. Three minus one is two and three plus one is four. So we get four and two are the two solutions. We don't have to check in the original because we did not start with the log. So you do not need to check here. All right, part D, we're totally running out of room. Maybe I'll just do this one a little smaller here. All right, so we got one fourth to the y equals one over 32. Now, 32 is not a power of four because four squared is 16 times another, oh, I lied, it is 32. Oh, wow. All right, four to the first is four, four squared. Oh, that's, four squared is 16, all right. 
4 cubed, 16 and 16 is 32. Nope, 4 cubed is 64. All right, so this won't work nicely because we just jumped right over 32. However, let's break all the way down to powers of 2. So 2 to the first 2, 2 squared, 4, 2 cubed, 8, 2 to the fourth, 16, 2 to the fifth, 32. Powers of 2 are easy because you just double. Uh, and we can see 2 squared and 2 to the fifth. Uh, now both of these are reciprocals, so it's 2 to the negative 2 to the y. And on the right side, we had 2 to the negative 5. All right, multiply these powers. 2 to the negative 2y equals 2 to the negative 5. So bases match. Negative 2y equals negative 5. So y equals positive 5 halves. And that's our answer right there. So this is the last one that apparently I pasted onto this page. So we'll be solving this one and then the next one in the next video. All right, one half to the x equals eight to the x squared. All right, we got our powers of two right here. Two cubed is eight. That's right at the top of the screen there. So on the left, we have two to the reciprocal power. And on the right, we have 2 cubed. So it's 2 to the negative x. We multiply negative 1 times x and multiply it by 3 to x squared. So that's 3 times x squared. So we're matching powers. Negative x equals 3x squared. And now I'm going to add x to the right side. All right. You are probably tempted to divide by x right here, but I'm wondering if you divide by x, you're throwing away a solution, which is x equals zero. So before you divide by that x, look at x equaling zero, and that's a solution. Good news is if you get all your terms on one side and factor, you're gonna find this solution very easily. So I'm factoring an x out, and we're left with three x plus one, and we got our zero product property, ZPP, which means either x equals 0 or 3x plus 1 equals 0 and subtract 1 divide by 3 so we get 0 or negative 1 third let's look back we did not start with an exponential so I do not need to uh, check these answers they'll both work